Um, do we have any public comment? Hi, Liz. And Brad and Kathy from far. Okay, seeing none. Um, we have an action item to approve the agenda. And I have a change, which is to pull <laughs> consent agenda item D, which is the admission of non-resident tuition policy, resident tuition students mm -hmm. policy. And I'm going to move that for more just so we can discuss a little bit more um, under board management and governance. And it's going to be the new item A. So we're going to do that at the top. And I'm sorry, you pulled that out of consent agenda and moved it down to board management and governance. I, it's going to be the new A and everything else will just bump down after. Um, does anyone have any other? I was curious about board management and governance item E. There's no link to a charge for facilities. Was that provided or did that not? Get we were just talking about that. And I think, I don't think anything was done since last meeting and before getting this agenda out um, earlier this week. It may be worth a conversation to see where, where we are. I think kind of the, the gist of my memory from that last conversation was around philosophically sticking with it sort of in an advisory capacity as it's sort of written now. So I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot of edits to it given that clarity of the conversation from last time. So we may be able to, through conversation, arrive at a place that feels good or perhaps not, and it can be on the next agenda. Okay, so it can stay here anyway, it doesn't need to be older. No. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions about the agenda? Okay, then we just need a motion to approve it with the amendment. So moved. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor of approving the agenda with the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right, moving down to the consent agenda. I may have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Mike and Kristen, did you second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of Approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Great. Moving right along down to executive limitations monitoring. Our first action action is to approve Patrick's monitoring report that he provided and is linked in the agenda. Um, 2.1, treatment of current or prospective students and parents slash guardians. Uh, and I did receive one worksheet, um, but if you have mm -hmm. any thoughts or comments on the report, please feel you free to share them. Take a motion first. Mm -hmm. I'll move to approve the monitoring report. And a second. Aaron, I'll second. Okay. And now we can discuss things, Steve. So, a uh, couple of issues. Patrick, it references um, emails with board chair as evidence, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include the email. Um, can you was, tell us where you are, yeah, Steve? I did this a while back. So now it okay. might be in a couple of places. I'm looking for it too. <clears throat> uh, communi oh, so it's the first section, communication with board chair. Top of page three. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it says, as the board chair involved in these exchanges can attest, and I'm assuming that's Dawn. Mm -hmm. So, and I would say to an extent, Krista, at this point, too, I think a lot of Especially, yeah, I've seen for a while. I would say probably over the past year. 
most of the communications have been with the three of us. Thank okay. You. All right. And I don't know if um I won. So I'm I'm not sure that there needs to be a copy of the email. That's the one question I just had was just um it's referencing something that other than getting the board chair to attest. Right. That's what I was wondering if would be more helpful. Is sort of it, an attestation, yeah. Yeah. Along with this re monitoring report, there's a, a some note from the chair that attests to. Um, yeah, just otherwise it's it's kind of secondhand. Right. Yeah, that would <clears throat> think some of that might be sensitive and not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with two. So I mean, it's just you wouldn't want yeah. the actual email necessarily, but you would want some agreement from the board chair. And I think for the the purpose in having it now is it's one of those things that if there was some question upon request, board members could have access to that. But making it a public document would be tricky because of the sensitive nature of a lot of emails. Either that, or so much would have to be redacted from it that. There wouldn't be a whole lot of context that you'd actually get. So, mm -hmm. but I think the attestation is not a bad idea. It's not unlike I think Floyd signs off every year that I don't make up my own salary and benefits. Um, so it'd be something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, under the accessibility front, um, there's a discussion about the potential for another elevator and the work we've done. <laughs> Is there any plan to do with the music area? Music area, other than the auditorium work that has happened already, the music area hasn't been a topic of conversation. I know that was part of the bond attempt a couple of times was to address the band room. Mm -hmm. I don't just want to be sure that's not falling off the radar somewhere. Uh, yeah, and I think the, the plan what was called for with that was to eliminate the spaces above the band room and yeah. raise that floor up so it's all at the, sort of this library hallway level. Yeah, which is a quite a big um, undertaking. Undertaking, yeah. I'm wondering if it, that might, um, I mean, this is kind of a facilities thing, but essentially I just, I, I just thought it, it, uh, it, it um, merited a mention that it's still one of the items that was a you know it was a big part of the bond vote. Um, there are there are other things that are could fall under that same banner, right? So I so I wonder if that this is a place to note you know, awareness of those things, which are marked in the capital improvement plan, right? That, so that piece of detail from the renovation plan with the bond and everything probably isn't part of the, mm -hmm. I don't think that's on the five-year plan at this point. And there are many other things that were part of that 30, whatever million dollar, depending on which one you pick bond that also aren't in the five-year capital plan. I guess I was wondering if there's a if there's any within our plan, is there any charting of general accessibility like flags in all of our mm -hmm. facilities? And if so, should they be? Because here we could say, you know, um, here here's the places where we still have not achieved that mm -hmm. and link to that. Yeah, I mean, I could see I could see for the, the facilities group um, maybe embarking on getting somebody to do a um, an ADA survey. So I think, I'm not sure this monitoring report or this section of uh, the aid documents is the right place. I mean, there is a right place for that comment, for that commentary. And I think has more to do with, I can't remember which one, but talks about, um, you know, maintenance and compliance and some of that stuff. This one here is talking about, you know, treatment of current prospective students and parents. And it is, it's real in that thing, but it's not the driver item. Yeah. So I would suggest we 
look at from an appropriate slot. I think that came up, might have been 2.6 maybe is the policy. I think you brought that up mm -hmm. at that monitoring report, Krista, which I think may speak to your point, Kevin, that that's, that's around this kind of planning. I think that's the policy that speaks to the mm -hmm. facilities and um, things of that nature. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I just, it was mentioned in here and that's one thing that popped into my mind. Yeah. <clears throat> um, And then this this was put out a little while back, and it's been a while. We sort of put this off to, and I don't know if it's timely to have an update on the legal action that have happened that we've been sort of um, have been brought up, or does are we sort of at the time that this was actually done, those weren't in play, or? Um. They were in di at different stages of play, I guess is how I would describe that. Yeah. Uh, I think the information we got that I updated the board on last time we met came just after this was submitted. Okay. So as far as this is concerned, it's still valid. That might just be a point others might want to be aware of just the query. Sorry, Steve, where are you? Yeah, unfortunately, like I, said, I mean, I did these notes back when it first came out, so I'm still- but, And I think the, at least on um, item two, the reference made to legal action is, I think is specific to privacy. Because two says, use methods of collecting, reviewing, transmitting, or storing student family information that fail to protect against improper access to the material listed. So it's really pretty specifically to FERPA, um, which did come, you know, those, there have been some questions since this was sent out um, around some FERPA practices that are sort of, have been reviewed and, and I don't think are actually FERPA. Um, but otherwise, when this came out, there was no legal action against the district around FERPA violations. Yeah. Probably still is not. I may have just misread what that was in, what that was referencing. I'm just scanning to see if there was any other reference to legal, or if it was just that one. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. I may have been referring to um, the very first paragraph. Whether anything that we've been dealing with <clears throat> recently would fall under that paragraph. The only one that I can see. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other comments? That's all. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Because anyone else? Anyone mm -hmm. in line? No. Okay. Are we comfortable to move on? All right. So those comments. I'm sorry, you haven't approved it. Right, I have to ask a couple of questions first. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so I, I've made note of those comments and for new board members and as a reminder to everyone, the comments, the responses to the questions I'm going to ask and the reports are all linked together into a tracking document and that's provided um, along with the, so every time a new report is written that is all in one tracking document so it can be referred to moving forward. Okay, so based upon the information provided, does the board find that the superintendent's interpretation is reasonable? 
Thumbs up if yes. Okay. Uh, does the data demonstrate accomplishment of this interpretation? Okay. So um, given that, all those in favor of approving monitoring report 2.1, please say aye. Aye. We're on, yeah, we're on 2.1 right now. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? Okay. All right, so now, we are on to monitoring report 2.2, .2, treatment <coughs> staff. So may I have a motion to approve this report? So moved. Kristen, and a second? I'll second. Bailey. Bailey. All right, anyone have any comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah, it was a separate email. Yes, it came in. Today. Six o'clock last night, I think. <clears throat> Maybe a little later than that, even. Twenty three hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're looking for the motion to approve. Uh, we've got that, okay. and so now is our time to discuss. I will just share in terms of the staff survey, which is the, that's the heavy lift part of this monitoring report, um, sort of sending that out and, and sort of theming and collating the data. Well, I, I did a comparison to last year's survey at this time and uh, across the board, the, I can't say across the board, with the exception of the, I have access to my contract and handbook. <laughs> All the other scores improved from last year. Um, some more so than others, but there was a, a noticeable trend toward the positive um, in all the all the areas measured, except for that one. Went from ninety eight point something percent to ninety five point something percent have access to their handbook and contract. So a slight decrease, but which is bizarre. Yeah. Uh, Kathy? You notice that in grievances, there's still an outstanding grievance from 22. Can you elaborate on that? That's the one that we've been meeting about. I'll assume that's sufficient elaboration unless you have more questions. <laughs> okay. Anything else? All right, so based on the information provided, does the board find that the superintendent's interpretation is reasonable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. And does the data demonstrate accomplishment of this interpretation? All right, all those in favor of approving monitoring report 2.2 treatment of staff, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. Moving on to the financial report. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the report? And Floyd is here, hiding in the back. <laughs> Ready to oh, make we some see more you. Make sure you knew I was here. Yeah, you're here. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, is your hand up? Before, okay. All right. Anyone have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, then next up is the superintendent report and links. Thank you, Patrick. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? They're great. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Okay. Congratulations on the 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. More. Finding a principal for Priscilla Richard. Oh, lovely. Yeah. All right. So moving on to board management and governance. Um, so I moved the item from the consent agenda for admission of non-resident tuition students to the top. So we'll start there. And if you haven't seen your email today, Jennifer sent an amended copy of that because it was cut off. Thanks to Kristen for noticing that. Um, and you'll see that that copy has strike throughs through it that were recommended by our board council, Dina, who's here. Um, and so, and let's see here. Okay, and so, and Dina's here, there were a couple of things she wanted to make sure that the board was aware of before we adopted this policy. Um, and these three things I'll share, and then if folks have questions, um, Dina can answer those. So first, that we recognize this is not a required policy. Um, second, if we do approve this policy, we can potentially be on the hook for um, special education or excess Section 504 costs that may be incurred. And three, that the possible um, issue of non-discrimination is real and, and potential exposure for the board. So this is a policy to um, find a way to welcome Lincoln students to attend our schools, but it is not without some potential concern. So um, Patrick or Dina, if you want to elaborate on that at all, we were going to just approve it with the strikeouts in the consent agenda, um, but we thought that it was worth just talking through those things so everyone's fully aware before we do that. I may offer just a little bit more context. Uh, so the board saw the a draft policy of this some number of months back now, three or four months ago, maybe. That was the model VSBA policy. Since then, I've had some back and forth with Dina. Dina had some concerns about even the model policy. And so she tried to address some of those concerns <laughs> in the edited version that you see now. Um, and even with the edits, there's still some things that are important to know as we consider adopting this policy, which is why Dina thankfully was able to be here tonight because it's it gets pretty complicated. There are, there are pros and cons to having this policy. It's worth thinking about talking through. Can we start with <clears throat> that yeah, first? Um, currently, we don't have a policy. There had been, I'm trying to remember if it was a policy or procedure, but essentially it said that MAOSD does not accept tuition students from other districts. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And, and so there was action taken to get rid of that because that would be complicated in accepting the tuition paying students from Lincoln, which I think we want to do. Um, so, yes, I think it's accurate to say that as of right now, there isn't a policy on how we handle tuition paying students from other districts. This is an attempt to address that. Um, and the, the pros are, it lays out how we do this. I think the risk and that Dina can elaborate on is um, basically when you have a policy that says you accept tuition paying students from other districts or from out of district, that opens you up to essentially accepting anyone who wants to send their students and paying tuition. Um, an example would be a, a someone who wants to privately pay for a student to attend. Um, and they would be paying the tuition rate for Mount Abe's tuition, for example, um, even if what is needed to provide their services greatly exceeds what that tuition rate is. So therein lies the liability for MAUSD. And if you say no to those who have greater needs, then you're discriminating. So that's essentially at the crux of it. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Dina, but that's sort of the, the challenge as I've understood it. <clears throat> so uh, I, uh, they, you are correct. I, my, my concern overall, just so that you know, the model policy used language for a lawyer that is troubling, which it you shall instead of may. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the major things I did remove. 
Um, but yeah, you as a federal recipient and as and as a um, a governmental entity, you can't discriminate anyhow, regardless of whether or not it says it in a policy or not. Um, but yes, if you open your doors to allowing non-resident students tuition in, you will have, and I think the possibility of it happening um, may be slight, but you may have a student who is a high need student based upon um, having a disability and that you will not have a sending school district necessarily for a parentally placed student, you would not have a sending school district that would be able to cover um, the cost for special education. If you have a, a student who is coming in as a tuition student from Lincoln, for example, um, you would be entering into an agreement with Lincoln about how the special ed costs would be covered. Um, because the Lincoln remains as a public school district re would remain as what's called the LEA, the local education agency. So that's that's a little bit different. And Patrick, we would be working on um, a pretty broad based agreement, sort of our understanding letter of understanding about that. Um, but you very well may have and it does happen sometimes. I have to be honest with you. Um, you may have what's called a parentally placed student, meaning that the parents live in a, are residents in a school district that does maintain a high school, and therefore there is not school choice other than the limited regional agreement school choice program. Um, and they may, for various reasons, want their child to come to your school. Sometimes it happens because their child has been expelled from their own school. Uh, sometimes it is because you have a specific program that they think or focus that they want their kid to be able to access. So that's that's what my concern was with the with it's not the issue of if there is a public school district that's behind the student tuitioning. My concern is for a very limited segment of that you when you open your door and you permit students to come in of those that if it is a parent who is making the determination without a public school that's behind paying for that tuition. I don't know if that confuses the issuer. I hope it doesn't. Thanks, Dina. Um, Brad's hand is up and then Liz. <clears throat> yeah, hi everybody. Sorry, sorry I'm not there tonight. Um, a couple of thoughts. I, 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 guess, I guess I understand the purpose of the policy is to help, you know, facilitate the, uh, you know, so admission of the Lincoln students. And I, I, am I right in understanding that that's that's the main impetus for for even having the policy? Yes, I would say yes. Okay, and well, okay. Then uh, the next point question I had, would, uh, next point I want to make is that I'm a little concerned about the word limited because if we're talking about um, a whole batch of uh, Lincoln students, is that, does that fall within the definition of a limited number of students who would be, um, you know, coming into the program unpursuant to this policy? I'm not, um, that's more a question, I guess, of sort of wording and semantics. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other um, thought I had is that, you know, Dina uh, correctly pointed out that you can't, under any circumstance, really um, discriminate on the basis of handicap or, or rather protected class. Um, and if that's the case, why then, if the purpose is to facilitate the movement of kids from Lincoln to Mount Abe, why do we have to have those sections um, in this policy? We can't get around it anyway. Why don't you just take them out? Would you like me to answer that? Yeah, that'd be great. I, I think I think you're right. I think you and you and I and I think the board members know that they can't discriminate. I think it's a notice issue to parents, perhaps as well. Okay. So it's sort of that tone. I think that's why it is in the model policy is a notice issue. Can you talk more about the limited piece around the word limited? Oh, um, 
but it, I mean, I, I mean, when I read the puzzle, I don't have it right in front of me because I'm in this, in this stupid car. But um, when I read it, it said that the the school district may, you know, uh, admit a limited number of students. I think like in the second or third sentence, isn't that right? On, on a limited basis, yeah. Or on on a limited basis, it, that just seems a, a little bit. Um, I don't know, not really reflecting, you know, what what was actually happening because. This isn't on a limited basis, is it? So you're suggesting we might not need that that language. Correct. Uh, Liz. Um, so it looks like there's some good work in here that maybe we should talk through a little bit. Um, the requirements of what it means to show that you're in good standing. I think those are important, right? So even if they were parentally placed, if they had been expelled, um, that would put them in not good standing for potentially to not be accepted. I really appreciate that um, a non-resident student was unable to provide evidence of good standing, that paragraph there. Um, if there is a reasonable likelihood that the applicant will benefit from and succeed in the programs offered in this district, right? I think um, it's a big commitment for people to choose a school and um, they're, if they're looking to be at Mount Abe, there's something about it that, yeah, like you said, is appealing to them. Um, and I just, I guess I'm just wondering what the difference is of how this would work. So when somebody is, is it going to look more similar to the 10 student school choice where you fill out the application, send it to the district, and it's kind of like approval or not approval letters are sent out? Um, or is it going to look more like um, the approvals for um, within our district that we've been doing that um, seem to have a very different process, like not a formal application and I, I don't know. So where, I guess I'm just trying to figure out a little more what this would look like, because it says that it can come to the board if it's denied. But I think the goal was to have kind of less barriers and less um, complications and to make it more accessible and open and kind of a more open process. So could you explain to me a little more about what you think it might look like? Procedure. Yeah, there really isn't a procedure. But I'm I'm also wondering, so I'm thinking about the potential to dive into this, and there's a lot we can dive into. I'm also wondering if if maybe now's a good time to, as Krista pointed out, this is not a required policy. So I wonder if staying big picture before we drill way down into this, mm -hmm. pros and cons of not having a policy at all. <clears throat> I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Dina, that you could share, because that's that's another option. We can have a policy, in which case we need to figure out what mm -hmm. does it say, and we can choose to not have a policy, and what are the implications if we go that route? So, so you know, you can effectively let students come in without a policy. Um, specifically, I, I, just so you know, it, it obviously would be predominantly focused on Lincoln students coming in. Um, you would have all of the same legal requirements. You can't discriminate. Once you open the door to Lincoln students coming in, there could potentially be an argument uh, for the parentally placed student. Um, I would have to think that through. I think the benefit of having policy is part of what a policy is, is, is the, for lack of a better way of saying it, and please argue with me if you want to, is having the the philosophical statement of what the board it, it views out there and it's in public. Um, you're, 
your admission of Lincoln students through um, tuitioning is going to be more so defined by an agreement about how you're going to bill about costs and and when when you're going to require tuition payments to be made and and, and things of that nature. Um, and that will focus and you don't need a policy to lay that out. I think um, the policy could perhaps be clarified a little bit, which is that when we're talking, we could put the language of that of parentally placed non-resident students, right? There's a difference there. I think generally speaking, you have had at least one inquiry this year from a parent or a group or or parents, I should say, who have wanted information on whether or not they could they could tuition their child into your school district. You don't have to permit that. Um, I think it's whether or not you feel that there's a benefit of having a statement of purpose and a statement of philosophy of what you're gonna do. Um, the having a board appeal to answer to Liz in general is because if you're specifically, if you're gonna be talking about denying people the right to get there, there should be an opportunity for people to have a conversation about it. And that denial and going to the board was more focused on the parentally placed student than it was on, on the issue of, um, a student who comes through school choice with a school behind them. You know, if you're going to expel a student who comes in through school tuitioning through school choice, you still have all the same legal obligations to to manage that expulsion, by the way. Um, and those exist whether or not you have a policy. Um, I think part of why VSBA put out a policy is that there is more of an opening of of school choice and and people wanting to be able to have their kids be able to access other schools. I'm not hard and fast about whether or not there's a benefit to not have a policy. I think a, a, an accurately reflective statement in a policy of of where where the board wants to go with it is is probably I would lean towards that as being a better option. I think I hit all of Liz's stuff too. Yeah. Your hand's sort of half raised, Sarah, yeah. but you, you sound couple, to me like you're pondering. So I have a couple <laughs> of questions. One, so essentially what this is saying is that we can't really say no to anybody. I'm confused by like the word agree with Brad on a limited basis. Is that our only phrase that gets us out of? allowing someone in unless they have like a really bad record. So I agree, like the $200,000 student where the parents are just potentially disgruntled and upset with one school and have the means to get their kid to another school. Well, it's um, that, it says at the discretion of the district. At, okay, mm -hmm. but that, but I agree that puts us in the discrimination thing mm -hmm. and, um, in those scenarios. And so then you're in the pickle. Um, and then the other, I, I work in a school district where I know many people that pay to go there and they are definitely parentally placed. And I'm, I've always been curious because I know that they haven't gone through the school choice mm -hmm. lottery mm -hmm. and process. And I just, I'm interested in what has been that procedure um for making that happen and I don't I mean it is I'm gonna while I like the I guess the ability it is once again a, a pretty big equity thing um that we want the kids but we're actually um we just I think we have to throw that piece in there the, the equity piece in our decision making if we even want the policy I don't know I'm Kind of on the fence on this, Kevin. You can make a distinction between school choice based upon tuition, tuitioning. You being open to doing tuitioning from uh, one from the Lincoln School District, right? Public school, public dollars tuitioning into your school 
versus not permitting parentally placed students. On the other side of it, it's like a positive thing to have people wanting to like go mm. to your school. And so why do we want to turn down that, that, I don't know if it's PR or that like drive and that, and it feel like, oh, we're making a wall. We don't want you because you don't live here. Like I, I'm really mm -hmm. stuck on the, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut no, you off, okay. Kevin, but I just, the other side of my coin was that. Um, so I'm floating around at different things and I'll probably get half of them in. But um, I'm thinking about whether to have a policy or not is the same thing we're grappling with interdistrict school choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not hearing a lot of reasons why we shouldn't right. um, get it out there and make it so it's known and even. And oh, by the way, there's a, I think there is a typo in 2A. Yes, there is. Yes. Okay. Yes. That too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. And um, my, my thought on a limited basis, and maybe there's a different way of saying it, is uh, the, the limitation would be whether we can maybe. accept into the school system without uh, an increase in personnel or an, or an increase in expenses, if you will, to accommodate that break point where all of a sudden you got to start hiring more staff, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So I, so I'm not so sure maybe that's what the intent of limited basis is, is we don't, we don't have a wide open thing with tons of capacity. We've got a certain amount of capacity. Maybe that needs to be detailed more than limited basis, which has some subjective um, aspects to it and, and I'm not sure and I, and I would have said yeah sure okay if this was in the consent agenda but now that we're talking about it the highlight in the second paragraph of two it starts out if in the discretion of the district blah 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 I'm not really sure why what that does for us particularly with the conversation of discrimination it's so let me answer that, I guess. Um, so as the board council, I am looking for as much flexibility as possible in decision making that would be permissible as opposed, there's a difference between shall and may and in the discretion of the school board or of the superintendent. Um, the discretion of either you as a board or the superintendent can never be arbitrary and capricious. That's sort of the baseline standard of it. So I, it is written for discretion to having flexibility of making decisions. You're still bound, however, by the, the fact that you can't discriminate. Um, and th that is still something there. But in, you know, there there are a lot of arguments about equity we, that that do come up with a policy such as this, which is that you are picking and choosing those students that potentially that you think will only be successful. Um, I I am concerned, Kevin, to be honest, when we say things about. Um, you know, hiring of new staff being a limiter. That yeah. could lead into, you know, we may have to hire support staff for a student who has a disability. We may have to hire a nurse if they have medical needs, you know. Um, so I'm I'm always concerned about things like that. But I wrote it trying to give you the broadest ability to address on an individual basis whether or not a student would be admitted. I think there are certain ways of doing it. Some schools would do it that if it's going to make them violate their agreed upon class size, they're not going to do it. But let's be honest, if Lincoln all of a sudden had a big bubble of kids that meant that you had to hire two teachers to cover the incoming class of freshman class for Lincoln, I think you all more than likely or your successor boards would be open to doing that. Um, it may mm -hmm. not be purely a financial reason for doing it. It could be a community-based reason for doing it, a supportive reason, right? Based on, on historical 
relationships. So, I, you know, I, I think having some things statute under under Vermont statute, I should say very clearly under the discipline statute, if a student is expelled from another school, every school in the state of Vermont has the right to uphold and recognize that expulsion and not allow the enrollment of the student. That's a statutory right for a school. So that exists whether or not that's in a policy or not. Um, I think sometimes kids engage in behaviors that may be difficult for them to be successful in their other school. And sometimes, and based on that, parents don't think their kid have gotten a fair shake and would be looking to go somewhere else. And that may be a that may or may not those behaviors may or may not be a concern and and for for you know having the student enroll in your school as well. So I, I get what all your concerns are. I think um, I you know I I mean I would take it from the board of of how you would like to deal with it. I I am I I would normally fall on being more policy, pro-policy, generally speaking, um, because I think that there's a benefit, if it's possible, if there's a benefit of having where somebody can be directed to and they can see what, what the criteria are of how kids come in. Um. I thought I saw Bailey's hand earlier. I don't know if you still had a comment. And then um, Kathy and Steve, but I want to also say that um, in the interest of time and thinking about the fact that we're talking about school choice a little bit later, um, that that we might consider after hearing those, those board comments, whether these are issues that need to be considered together because they're they're they have some inner relationship. So anyway, um Bailey and then Kathy and then Steve. So one of the pieces I was looking at is that we are really talking about Maldi here, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually have an age limit in the policy. And I don't know if there's any state pieces or things already in place that would um, prevent an elementary school student um being tuitioned in but that doesn't seem to be necessarily covered there's just a little bit about um uh, under tuition um this is elementary and secondary mm -hmm. students but i wasn't sure if we needed to narrow it or if like krista just said maybe that all kind of gels together when we discuss the other pieces i don't know many students that tuition in elementary from out of district um, I was just curious. Are you okay if I just make a note of that mm -hmm. and then we can see what we want, what makes the most sense? Um, Kathy? Just sort of as a point of reference, Middlebury, uh, sorry, Middlebury would be accepting Lincoln students on the same basis, correct? Mm -hmm. So what policy do they have in place? They have the BSP. Do, do they have a policy? Sorry. You have the VSBA model policy, um, as does Edison Northwest, mm -hmm. which is and basically the, the unedited version of what you have in front of you. So have they had to wrestle with these same issues? Uh, I can't say. I haven't heard of them wrestling with any, but it doesn't mean that they haven't been. And, and my other question was, there's a section, I think it's in section two, that says if a child has attended school. So if for some reason we have a preschooler coming from out of, di out of district that wants to come, they would have had not attended school. So I'm, I'm going to just answer very quickly. It's very few and far between where you have elementary age students, um, specifically around you, you have Hancock, Granville. Um, that tuitions, I believe, they're elementary students that, because it's a um, non-operating school district, right? School um, score, I think, is also one in our area. I'm sorry? School score, mm -hmm. which is... Oh, uh, I always forget the gores. It's a yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize to the gores. Um, 
Yeah. So, but they're not a huge amount of elementary age kids who would be tuition. So the, there are, there is a specific statute in title 16 under the 800s, it's 821 or 822 around there, um, that if you maintain an elementary school, then that that's where your, your child would go. There's a one limited exception, which would be a geographic one um, that comes up very infrequently. So again, any, any elementary student typically, other than identifying from a non-operating school district around you, would be a parentally placed student. The majority of them would be that. Um, I don't suspect that Middlebury or Addison Northwest have a great many problems under the tuitioning school choice from non-operating districts or, or districts that have school choice at the high school level, right? So for uh, Chitton and Brandon, Barstow Unified Union School District has choice um, because there is either an agreement between them and, and the sending district about how costs will be made and, and when payments will be made, or it's done purely by invoicing. And was this discussed with Lincoln before they seceded from the district? What, and what was the input there? There was no discussion. Other than the assumption that Mount Ag would be accepting of tuition paying students. But so conceivably, next... Mount Abe could be Mount, uh, conceivably Mount Abe could get some very high priced students from Lincoln, and it's their assumption, and it was accepted that they would come to Mount Abe. I think at least have the option. I think the details of exactly so Dina's in the process right now working on an MOU with Lincoln to clarify mm -hmm. exactly procedurally how all the transfer of funds happens and for what and at what cost to articulate that. But that that level of detailed conversation didn't happen as part of the withdrawal. Mm -hmm. it, that's that's a purely legal obligation for the town for the uh, Lincoln Town School District is that they they remain responsible for the education of their resident students. And so that's very different. They they will be wherever those students go. If they are a high need special education student, they will be responsible for those those costs in in if they went to Middlebury, if they came to your district, if they went to White River Valley Supervisory Union schools. The the one that is the issue of having the expensive student and nobody on the quote unquote hook for is the parentally placed one. And I don't know, Patrick, you, you can answer. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever had a request since you've been superintendent of a parentally placed high school student. It is infrequent, I would say, in my estimation. Um, and generally, it is about a student who has been expelled from another school district. Yeah, I can't think of a specific example. Um, it is very few and far between. Typically, the tuition cost is a barrier for most families at sixteen or eighteen thousand a year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Steve, and then we'll get the pulse of what whether we want to keep discussing or move on. So, on, <clears throat> in terms of the big question, I think having a policy is a critical thing. Um, who's going to remember next year and a year after, and the year after that, what we decided or what we wanted to do? Or I mean, this just records the history of the discussion, and, and it gives somebody a place to go look for how to do something when they need it. That's that's uh, I think as useful as anything. Um, I have to admit I'm I'm a little bit confused about the whole tuition thing. I did not realize we didn't allow people to pay for students to come here. Um, I thought we already set a tuition rate every year. And who is that for if it's not for people sending people here for tuition? Part of that is to establish the statewide average tuition rate, which is used for, uh, like, so if, if we use the Lincoln example, if if Lincoln is paying for a student to go um, to something other than a public school, Lincoln by statute 
has to contribute the statewide average tuition rate to whatever that private entity might be. In the absence of schools producing a tuition rate, they can't calculate the state average, so it plays a role there. Um, <clears throat> and, and didn't we have like 10 slots or something where we agreed to have somebody come in? So that's a different, that's a high school choice. So there's no exchange of dollars for that. Um, right. but that's in statute, the high school choice um, process. All right. That's between districts only at the high school level. Correct. A certain school. number of slots. Yep. Right. Different depending on the size of your school, but it's right. a limited number. Yeah. So those are the things that we're getting right here, spinning about the whole topic in general. Yep. Right. Those students should also have, and there should also be an underlying understanding of special ed back billing, although it just may be happening without an agreement at this point in time, without a formal MOU or something like that. The last version of kids, the 10, the 10 slack kids. So I'm wondering if I can get a sense from the board on whether we want to move forward with a policy and just start with that question. Do we think we need a policy? Put your thumb up if you do. Okay. And then my next question is, um, are we comfortable with the policy, um, with adopting this policy tonight with the strike throughs that Dina recommended, as well as there's a typo, <laughs> um, a number two letter A that needs to change the wording from has to have. Um, and then the third edit would be taking out limited basis. So are we, I guess the question is there's three there, um, are you comfortable adopting it tonight with those three changes? Ask for one more. Uh, yeah. And that would simply to be to direct the superintendent to come up with procedures and applications for implementing the program. That leaves it in Patrick's hands to. Right, and we do that in other policies where we, we don't we don't describe the procedures. We just hand the authority to develop the procedures. To so are you suggesting that we? We put that language in here. Yeah, or... so that somebody's not looking for the procedures in the policy, they're <laughs> looking for a person. That... Yep. Yeah. So if we do that, do we need to have that in place before we adopt this policy? Mm -hmm. So we can't refer to a procedure in a policy if we don't have the procedure yet. I think a number of times the policies will articulate, just as Steve said, the procedures to be developed by the superintendent, right. and that's to okay. end of it. Okay, so that would live. And essentially the MOU that Dina's working on is mostly procedures. It's going to be, here's when you pay, here's how much you pay. Here's how you apply. So we would borrow, take a lot of what Dina's putting together to formulate those procedures. <clears throat> so would it be at the so, end of? Are we taking out the, the word limited? Let's go one by one with the edited changes. How about okay. that? So we're Thank clear. You. So first is the edit to change on number two A from that they has not to that they have not. Easy. Okay, so yeah. good on that one. All right. The next one is um, taking out on a limited basis. Can we redefine it instead of take it out? I think the next sentence sort of does okay. yeah. define it as much as we're able to. So you're saying keep it in. No, no, take it out. Take it out. So a period after students and then let the next sentence do all the work. So who put that in there? Yeah. D uh, no, the VSBA that's in the model policy. No, the the purple. No, the uh, purple is purple's Dina. So what was the question? So we heard some people say we don't know. Well, I don't know if we heard, or I didn't catch the rationale of putting that in there. Putting in on a limited basis. Yeah, that's the model 
No, um, it, it no. clarifies instead of when space is available, it's saying we're going to go a little bit more specific and have a little more discretion about what we mean by availability, which opens us up to discrimination issues, but also but, gives us. But our council is the one that did that. I'm 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 okay removing limited if I mean one of the things correct me if I'm wrong Krista but the way the sentence is sort of designed it could say um based upon the administrative regulate you know the criteria established in the administrative regulations if that's what you're talking about with the procedures or consistent with administrative regulations would that fit in there Patrick if you read it out I was putting in limited in terms of because you were talking about capacity. And I thought that limited was a better defined word for capacity for for having that capacity issue addressed. I guess I'm not sure when you're when you're speaking about administrative regulations, I'm not sure. What you all call procedures, I would call administrative regulations. <laughs> I should probably say that. Dean is saying take out on a limited. If we take that out, you would say instead non-resident students right in, uh, in, right does that work be consistent with the basically you're tying it back to the procedures mm -hmm. that lay out some of the details so you're saying as as articulated in the procedures i'm trying mm -hmm. to and then wordsmithing from there to make that make sense in the context of what's here mm -hmm. Of non resident students. As outlined in the procedures that accompany this policy. Which is, is that things that we could maybe make changes to easier than making changes to a policy? Right. So, generally speaking, board right. sets policy, superintendent drafts procedures to adhere to policy, okay. which is sort of what Steve was alluding to before. Mm -hmm. Right. Easier to change procedures without going through the policy adopting and modifying process. Right. If you go on our website, there's the clear delineation between policy and procedures. <clears throat> and most policies have an accompanying procedure with a similar title or number or something. So that, I think if what I'm hearing is <clears throat> correct, that, that first sentence would read, it is the policy of the Mount Abraham Unified School District to permit the enrollment of non-resident students as outlined in the procedures that accompany this policy period. Decisions regarding the enrollment of non-resident students shall be made at the discretion of the district. I would, I would say referenced. As referenced. Mm -hmm. Instead the, of a company because. As well, outlined in the policy yeah, procedures yeah. that reference. <laughs> yeah, that, okay. And, okay. All right, and so then, on a limited basis stays out. Okay, so that would be the second change. The typo is the first change, which we agreed on. That would be the second change. Everybody, okay? yep. And it's just gonna say to, to fully flesh that out, I think Dina's point in, in doing so is any of the limiting factors that you might want to have Need to be in the are going to be more detailed in that procedure that's there. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually, it takes out the word on a limited basis, words on a limited basis, but it actually still limits it to the extent you would want to limit it anyway mm -hmm. in the procedure. Mm -hmm. So the protection that Dina was going for with the language here with limited basis is still present. Mm -hmm. And and because procedures don't have to come back to the board for approval, they are more readily modified on a timely basis. So when we realize that we're not as protected as we thought we should be. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> quickly. I, li I, li I like how I say it one way and Patrick translates for me. That works perfectly for me. Okay, so that would be the second change. Are we all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the third thumb would be for the remainder of the document with the um, suggested changes that that are in purple that Dina made. Um, were we going to add something to direct the superintendent to create procedures? I mean, I don't think that is going to be in the policy. We're not going to write that in the policy, right? We would. Maybe next time. 
it's inferred that there is a procedure. And it's saying that there's outlined. I don't. Are you suggesting we write in the policy that we're going to direct the superintendent to create the procedure? That's how it's done in other policies. We, that, that basically gives them, that defines the executive limitation. That's. But then once you've done it, you have to change the policy to say that, to take that out. No. That direction. No, we, we say we'd leave it to the, you know, we're leaving the creation of the policy to the administration, basically. Without saying. Can you just add to that sentence that says, as outlined in the, as that, permit the enrollment of non resident students as outlined in the procedures that reference this policy that the superintendent is going to create? I'm, I guess I'm not clear um, what administration or something that just says that where it lives, who's responsible for it. Oh. So not that it has to be created, but that that is who is the creator. That's right. Gotcha. I understand. Created okay. by the superintendent. That the references mm -hmm. policies procedure that. Procedure. That reference this policy developed by the administration. Good. Okay. And Kathy has her hand up. Go ahead, Kathy. Krista, at what point does it come back around and the board revisit if the procedures support the policy that we developed? I don't know what our board policy and practice is around that. that well, this policy would be this policy would be monitored. Yeah. Yeah. And we that that those procedures would be evidence. So somewhere. I'm monitored by whom? I guess that's my question. The board. We would create a monitoring report system like we do for all other procedures. Thank and you. Then, like in the last one, we, uh, one of the ones we just adopted, we just um, we just reviewed. Like the student handbook was. But this is a C level. But this policy. is not an executive limitations policy, so. That would be it's more steps to change in, in practice to okay. develop monitoring reports because there's a whole host of other policies that are not sort of right. neatly tucked within policy governance that we don't right. have a monitoring. We can develop it. We just don't have it right now to monitor those in the same way. Yeah. Krista, I found language in another policy if you'd like to know exactly what it says. Same thing like that. The superintendent shall develop administrative rules and procedures to ensure the implementation of this policy. Exactly what I found. Are you on the attendance one too? Uh, I don't know. Yes, I okay, wow. okay. I'll come back to that. But what I think we maybe for the policy and governance committee to ponder is we right now we have a yearly monitoring schedule for all of the executive limitations policies. And this doesn't fit into any one of those. So it's, it's more district operations policy. And so um, we have to, I think, figure out how to how to weave that in? Maybe not annually. It Maybe. might be. Well, is the concern that you want to be able to read the procedure that's developed? You can read the procedure that's that's developed, but also it's a, it's a way of us to sort of monitor exactly how many of these requests we're getting to move into the district to, to move the students into our schools. I think we don't have a really. <clears throat> there is a. There is on our work plan comes up every year where we talk about tuition and um, numbers of budget. students coming in for that. And so could this be part of that update? Yeah, I mean, so every year the board has to actually approve a tuition rate um, and the board approves a number of seats in and out for the high school choice that Steve was talking about. <laughs> so it, it could it hasn't been the past practice, but it could be part of that conversation to hear more about how many kids are actually taking advantage of this and what does that look like, both the ins and the outs. And yeah, that'd be good. And a lot of times that question gets asked when that's on the agenda, but it isn't um, something that is always asked. But I think that that yeah. we could make that note when that comes up. But you guys would keep metrics on those anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that and I, I just I'm concerned that we're we're a board that's creating all these policies, but then we don't ever really know how they're how are they enacted. You know, we we 
give it to Patrick. He does a phenomenal job of it. But then as a board member, I have no idea what that policy, what happened to that policy and how it's being, how it's being followed or is it being followed and is it following the intent? And that's the, so in a, typically in policy governance boards, you have your, poly, your, your executive limitations and those basically those sets of policies are what you would adhere to. And those would be the only policies in a perfect world. In Vermont, there are certain statutes that require boards to have policies in addition to those policy governance policies. So our past practice has been only the ones that are required by law do we have additional policies beyond the ends, executive limitations, et cetera, uh, for this very reason that we're talking about. There is a very clearly defined structure for monitoring all of the ends and executive limitations policies, which theoretically are supposed to fully define my work. Achieve these ends in any way you see fit that don't violate these executive limitations. Beyond that is at your discretion. It gets a little complicated when we start talking about these other policies that don't fit as neatly. In. And I would just add, so an example of that is the VSBA has a recommended equity policy and our board instead wove equity language into an existing executive limitations policy so that it it is ensured to be monitored on our regular schedule, which we're really good at adhering to rather than being added onto a really long list of policies that we don't might not regularly get added to. So it may be that we decide that this policy relates to um, an umbrella executive limitation. And therefore, when Patrick provides his monitoring report every year to that bigger policy, he refers to this as some sort of evidence. So, um, you know, so that you're right, we don't want to have all these things that we never know about, but we also want to make sure that they're that there's a way for us to, to manage checking in on them within a process that already exists. So that could even be written into this policy. At the end, it could be talked how it is monitored. It could be could be put in the end to say this policy would be monitored under um, I'm making one up, A13, blah, 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 uh, on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. Um, so we wouldn't be monitoring C13. Right. We'd monitor it through right. something we're already monitoring. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, do we want to figure that out right now or adopt it with these changes we made and then come back to it to What's see how it gets woven in with our regular yeah. update on tuitioning of students? Um, I'm still a little unsure about the, the parental choice as opposed to districts that don't have high schools. So not to throw a wrench further, but it felt like that was a pretty big discussion that I didn't get a sense of a resolution as to whether we wanted this to apply to both cases or whether we might actually subdivide and only direct this policy to a subset of this, uh, of this tuition waivers, I suppose. Mm, that's a good point. That, that to me feels like something that might be important enough to, to actually specify within this policy. I imagine as is right now, it, it's a blanket. Anybody who wants to come here can, uh, within restrictions of limited or whatever wording is. But it felt like the areas that, that Dina raised of concern really only applied to a small subset of the parental choice. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we might be able to protect against those potential adverse consequences for the district in a really focal manner by starting this policy for those districts that don't have a high school or don't have the or don't have the the infrastructure to send their school their students themselves so just trail back well, or maybe i just read that just oh, no no i think you're right i don't think we actually talked that one all the way through so i'm trying to unpack what you're saying so I can any a student that comes from anywhere in the state that doesn't operate a high school, we're focused on Lincoln because that's yeah. they're in our forefront, but really this would accomplish mm -hmm. anywhere in the state if they don't operate a high school and presumably their town pays the tuition. So I alluded to this a little bit before. Um, a, a town that does not operate a high school, if they have to, they're obligated to pay tuition to private 
education institutions at the average tuition rate of the state. If a child in that town chooses a public high school, the town is on the hook for the tuition rate at that public high school. Um, so anywhere in the state, theoretically, kids could come to Mount Abe and that would be covered here um, if the town's paying tuition. But in those scenarios, it would also be tuition plus any other special needs costs right. that and would the, also come from that district. Exactly. So that's the backing that Dina Which was about. distinct from the other scenario. Exactly. Right. So, and I think it's, so what you're saying that the, the parentally placed concern isn't necessarily addressed in the policy language as it, re, as it reads now. Exactly. Right. I mean, right now it seems like both would be able to have access to the district, which we might ultimately agree is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like one comes with real potential financial risk and the other one doesn't because right. it's sort of baked into the framework of the state's yep. system already. Yeah. Well, so there, there is a semantics to that. I think we've talked about before. Lincoln has a responsibility for that special ed person. This district accepts it. Lincoln may not accept what this district feels is necessary for that student. This district could very well decide to provide something over what Lincoln says is necessary just because that's the way we do it. And it would be discriminatory in that sense if we didn't. So we're, we potentially could be on the hook for some dollars with Lincoln kids even, maybe obviously not as many as somebody that comes in with none, but. And you're, you're starting to unpack some of the the challenges that Dina is going to articulate in the um, MOU with Lincoln, because that's, to me, that's a, a significant concern in that Dina mentioned before, Lincoln is the LEA. They are the lead education agency, and they make the decision about what services kids get or don't get. Those students may be here at Mount Abe, and what we provide may be subject to what Lincoln decides we provide. That's still separate, though, from the so so that's in the case of a district that does not have a high school. The parentally placed student is different because that student would be coming from a district that does have a high school. Yes. Is that right. the better so, school choice? Can I make if 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 the board does not wish to open up tuitioning in parentally placed students from other, from wherever. I think if your policy clearly says that, it would be beneficial. If that's what if that's what your concern is, is the parentally placed student from other places, just make the distinction in the policy. Or we could make the distinction in your procedures. But I would I would prefer it to be in the policy, to be quite honest with you, to clearly be enunciated in the policy. Does that make sense, or do you need more from me on that? That's clear. Liz, Liz go ahead. Um, so there are limitations that are apply in here to both parentally placed students and others, right? So there's the one, two, three, um, or ABC, sorry, um, and. Um, there also might be kiddos that want to come for a sports program. There also might be some for social reasons. All of the 10 that are, are opened up every single year are parental placements to the best of my knowledge. These aren't kiddos that the LEA is like, hey, we, the, we need a better fit. We're looking for something that looks different or we don't feel like we can meet the needs here. So we're looking for a better fit. Like those thoughts that we currently have are just from people who are looking at other schools for whatever their reasons are. And I'm not sure why we would want to limit that. Um, even if there's diversity in needs, you know, we're developing the gray house, which has some really awesome things in it. And we have some really great schools that can do a lot of great things for a lot of kids. And I just, um, would hesitate to say that that we need any more um, supervision over who's allowed into our district when Vermont in general, we know we're all looking at a lot of empty space in our schools. So maybe 
more kids of with certain needs of any type would help us be able to create programming as well. So I, I wouldn't necessarily, um, I don't feel that we need any more restrictions than we already have in there. I wonder to Aaron's point if, you know, like what Liz said about school choice and if those seats are not usually, do we usually have 10 seats filled? No, we do not usually fill the incoming seats. Um, and if we did, we could revisit it, opening that to more seats. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I wonder if maybe this is just strictly for non-resident students of districts without high schools. I, can I add one thing though? Yeah. I, it's, it, we're missing, a, it's not just high school. Like the, I think the big group is actually the middle school. And okay, so middle, I, okay, I yeah. feel like, but school choice is only related to high school. So mm -hmm. I, I, I personally think we should just leave it as it is and not roll in and tie in all the pieces, like actually just have a policy that's about, will we allow people to come to school here? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I think we want to say yes. Mm -hmm. So if they can get in from the high school choice at that level, well, that's a whole different game than okay, I really actually want my kid to go to high school there. And it would be great if my kid could start out by going to seventh grade and eighth grade there. And now they're going to pay. Mm -hmm. I, I just like, I, I think we're missing it if we don't do it. Like, I liked how Liz put it, that it, it actually could create, what could be challenges might actually be like creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, opportunity not, versus an opportunity, and in that <clears throat> instead of looking at all the walls all the time, we yep. like need to be yeah, looking so at all the chance. I think Mike's point was good to discuss. Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement. I think we just mm -hmm. litter. How about that? Yeah, I mean to be very clear, I had no real sense of which way policy should or shouldn't go, but it, it felt important that we sort of defined what we wanted the policy to be, knowing the potential benefits and knowing the potential risks, because there's risks either way, right? There might be financial risk, but there's also risks to the kids who couldn't come here, right? Or the inability to use this as a way to build programs. And so it feels to me like this discussion sort of allows us to settle as a board where we think the relative benefits and costs are and go with the one that seems to well weigh the other, which I'd like a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to say in the interest of time. Yep. So um, how about one more comment and then go ahead, Kathy. Uh, Dean, I have a quick question for you. Moving forward, if for whatever reason this policy is too cumbersome, we have just a huge influx of folks that love to come to us. How difficult, given, given this precedent of having X number of years of allowing and welcoming everybody, how difficult would it be to tighten the reins going down the pike? As long as you had the will of the board and you posted it and warned it appropriately, it, you can do it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna read that, that first paragraph again with um, language that um, Katrina found that is in another policy. Um, it is the policy of the Mount Abraham Unified School District to permit the enrollment of non-resident students, period. The superintendent shall develop administrative rules and procedures to ensure the implementation of this policy, period. And then everything else would stay the same. Okay, so we've got that change. We've got the um, typo change, and then we have all of the other suggested changes from Dina. Do I have a motion to approve this admission of non-resident tuition student policy? So moved. Kathy, and a second. So are we motioning for this or are we motioning to amend? As amended. We're amending it. 
-hmm. As amended, thank you. I'll second. And Aaron. Okay, all those in favor of approving this policy as amended and which the amended version will be attached version will be attached to the minutes. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Any abstentions? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Thank you for the good discussion, everybody. Appreciate it. And thank you, Dina. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, we can catch up in next day or two. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. You all have a very nice night. Right. You too. So we have 20 minutes in this section for adhering to the schedule. And okay. we were supposed to allot 30 minutes of that to the discussion for elementary school choice. Okay. doke. So uh, let's see how far we can get. We have... Um, the next item, which is to approve monitoring report 4.5, board members code of conduct. Kristen Toy's first monitoring report ever. Oh <laughs> it's good, uh, right? Everybody loves it. <laughs> so may I have a motion? <clears throat> or I'm can somebody, you. thank you. And then a uh, second. I'll second, Bailey. Okay, any comments or questions about the report? Okay. Nicely right. done. Nicely done. Thank you. I, I have to be totally transparent though. I had a I had a really great previous year piece to work <laughs> with. So our <laughs> girl. Work work That's smarter, true. not harder. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> All right. All those in favor of approving report 4.5, board member board member code of conduct, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Abstentions. Great. Moving on. And I this came in your email also, I believe, 23 hours ago. Thank you, Bailey, for doing <laughs> uh, monitoring report 4.6 board committee structure. And if you check your email and want to open that, if you, it's not attached to the agenda and will be attached to the minute. Very concise. Um, <laughs> a quick peek. And if you have any thoughts or questions, may I have a motion to approve that first, actually? So moved. And a second. No second. Okay. So any comments, thoughts, questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor of approving monitoring report 4.6, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Kathy. Okay. Oh, Kathy, yes. I admit I didn't have time to read it, so I won't vote on what I have not read. Oh, you have seen. Thank you. Just Thank you. Two. Oh, yes. yeah, she stepped away for a minute for both of those. Yeah. Okay. Next, we have the um, uh, motion to approve the updates to the articles of agreement reflecting the Lincoln withdrawal, which has... Um, straight throughs and changes there. Um, and then to ask Sarah, who had mentioned that there was a mistake with the um, board turnover part of the agreement. I can't remember if I reached out to Jennifer about that or not. Um, she noted that it shows we only have one, in Bristol particularly, that when they have one seat turning over, and we have two. Um, and so we could approve it with that amendment. I thought there was something else, but. I think what she suggested is we label oh, yeah. those seats with the letter, the letter or a number so that they could be tracked. Oh. As mm -hmm. opposed to five like, seats, you'd have five people, five people. Five like that. Uh, Bristol yeah. 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 And yeah. that might help with the, the class regulation. The way we're the gerrymander of the town. Is that like a scarlet letter <laughs> for me? <laughs> oh, she's the Lincoln. <laughs> okay, so we can make those two changes. Is there any? Oh, we need a motion. So the motion would be to approve. Okay. Yeah. 
So moved. If you want to stay with that. I'll second. All right, now we can continue talking. Um, so we noted two potential edits. Um, anything else that anybody sees? Have questions or comments about? So I guess the council has prepared this and I guess it's tacit, it's tacit um, that it's not, it doesn't require a vote, voter approval because they've approved it. Everybody's approved the exit. This is just- You mean by the towns? The towns. Don't need to approve this again because it's Correct. approved and it's just a matter of bookkeeping if you will. Yep, I talked that through specifically with Dina, and that was the conclusion that it has it has been approved already. This has happened. We're now just sort of catching up. Documenting. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, so you're making edits to the agreement? Yeah, so I think we need to withdraw that motion. I think it can be approved as amended yeah. okay. as long as you're clear on the amendments. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Can we clarify the amendments for me, please? Yes. So um, we're going to vote to approve the Articles of Agreement with the following amendments. The first would be to change the number of terms expiring in Bristol in 2024 from one to two. Then the second would be to label all board seats with letters. Is there more clarity needed there? I think there's more clarity. I haven't at least wrapped my head around the changing the March 2024 from one to two without changing one of the twos to one. Right. I don't know which one we'd be changing from two to one. Mm. And I think the the sort of cadence that you see here with the number of seats mm. expiring is the originally intended cadence. We got off track. I think that um, 2025 is correct because mine is a one-year term. So and my seat was bumped from a two to a three. Two years ago, so I don't know if that is the two. Well, I guess part of what I'm getting at is there. There are two different approaches here. We can change the articles of agreement to reflect the current schedule of expiring seats that we're on, mm -hmm. or we can get we can make adjustments to the seats to get back on track with the originally intended cadence. So the if you notice the 18, 19, 20. The five seats were one expiring, two expiring, two expiring. And that should that pattern should repeat itself yeah, yeah. each three years. Right. So as if we change, happens. so if we change 2024 20, to two, which it is. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot easier just to change the articles. No, the cadence. Oh, the cadence, yeah. Not from my point of view. Get back on track with what it should be. How do we do that legally? Mm. Um, I think it will take a little bit of time. Like folks that ran for, say, a three-year seat and got into a three-year seat have to fill that term. Um, and I'm thinking about folks that were appointed to fill for the rest of one year. Right, because there I may be an opportunity in there in terms two of years. Because I filled or I finished out last year, and then two more years would equal that three year. I think. I think there's a way to map it out. It may take a couple of years or cycles to reset and get back where it needs to be. Um, and I've had some conversations with Jennifer about that. I'm not recalling the details of those right now. Um, but I think taking advantage of appointed seats, and so when we go to when when folks run for those seats, to be really 
clear, clear about is this a one or a two or a three year seat right. that they're running for to mm -hmm. take advantage of that right. normal turnover already mm -hmm. to get back on track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for the warning of these updates, what do we what do we want to do? Um, we could, so we know, as you mentioned, 2022, like it wasn't two. <laughs> That's a fact. So we could put a make an asterisk or something and make a note that acknowledges that if the intent is to change the cycles to get back onto what this original intent was. Would it just be this year that we're not on cycle? So the problem is I don't know if Jennifer Cross referenced. We have a document that is very clear. I don't know that sh that this, not Jennifer, but that this cross reference that. So I'm kind of wondering if we should just do that and then bring it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this stuck because with what was in the original, yeah. and that doesn't yeah. reflect what has happened. There are probably other errors I suspect yeah, in here as I well. So it might make more sense to just. I mean, I'm just, I meant to. Yeah, I. I I would or just refer with, to a document with the current no, just count. keep with this is the mm -hmm. what it is. And I mean the rationale is that we've had a lot of um, appointments mm -hmm. and, and they're out of sync. So we'll use, utilize those appointments to get back in sync. So what about just putting an asterisk if those were um Appointments have been made, but yeah, I mean, yeah. you could, but I don't even see why you need to type them. Because yeah. whatever seats are coming, like when your seat comes up, whatever you, you're a three year seat, mm -hmm. technically, right? So your seat would just be a three year fill, mm -hmm. and we would be back on cycle. Because it's less important which seats. Right expire in a year it's more important that the correct number of seats expire in a year and that's what gets us and there is a document that's a living document this is this is designed to not be a living document it does design not to change so i it, it, there is a document that is living and changeable that this could just refer to for current um blah 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 Do all these changes have to go back to the publish? No. No, I talked that through with Dina. Mm -hmm. As, because the, and, and her justification was because the withdrawal has already been approved by everybody, and these changes are simply reflecting the dominoes of so the just withdrawal. administrative recording of what was approved earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> and it reflects that MAUSD isn't actually five towns anymore, and all the, you know, all the dominoes that fall from that. And memorializes so it's clear, like it, like it specifically references the date upon which Lincoln withdrew, Draw. and just kind of codifies a lot of things that are out there, somewhat common knowledge, but yeah, memorializes them here. So why don't we do your suggestion, Krista, where we uh, keep this document the way it is and reference the southern document for chair seat terms. So we would put, we could put an asterisk below the chart that says the current terms for each town foreign representatives. Are captured in it. Our article, the document is named, it has a name. Captured on a board. I guess we can't hear the names for them. Mm -hmm. 
Patrick, it looks like there was always going to be one year where you're going to have five. If you look at the trajectory, there's always going to be one year when you have five, the others you're going to have four. So this, what, what's here now is clear that it's on track. Right, I think what's here now is how it was intended to be. And it's really more on a town by town basis. Um, so that you avoid, like, for example, you wouldn't want a year in Bristol where there are three seats turning over or zero seats turning over. I might be in agreement with Kevin here and just not mention the reference document. Mm -hmm. The intent is clear in the articles and we just administrate it outside of this. What do people think? We good with that? Yeah. Okay. Great. That's easy. Easier. Mm -hmm. All right. So then we're going to vote to approve the updated updates to the articles of agreement. Mm -hmm. Please say aye. Uh, aye. Oh. Any opposed? And just Sarah is abstaining. Okay. All right, moving down, we have an action to authorize the chair and superintendent to accept the IDEA B, IDEA, or IDEA. Both are acceptable. Both are acceptable. <laughs> grant fund. So I put a link in the chair notes if folks are interested in knowing what that grant program is. We receive money from that program every year to support early ed and special ed. And the part of the requirement is that both the chair and the superintendent um, Sign to authorize the acceptance of these funds. So may I have a motion for that authorization? I'll make a motion. Okay, Bailey. And Kristen. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, thoughts? All right, all those in favor of authorizing the chair and superintendent to accept IDEA B grant funds, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? How much, Krista, how much was the grant fund for? Do you have any idea what the dollar amount would be? But let's see if somebody does. I don't know, later. Beth has easy access to that. I don't, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Is that number change every year? In, you know, big swings or is that, where do we get? I don't think it's big swings. No. It stays pretty consistent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Beth is seeing she can find that for us. Let's move on. We have um, to adopt the committee charges for the Finance and Facilities Committee. The Finance Committee charge as was updated and linked to the agenda. The Facilities Committee charge, was that changed at all, Kevin, from our last? It was changed to reflect the conversation at our last meeting. Okay, so I'm going to make sure. It may still be in there. So we're going to have to go back to if this earlier email. I'm going to, uh, no, I'm going to send it right now. Hopefully you got it. I just sent the email, but hopefully the attachment is included. Did do folks see it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. All right. So um so let's start with the Finance Committee. Well, yeah, let's start with the Finance Committee. Let's do that separate. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the committee charge for the Finance Committee? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Aaron, in a second? I'll second. 
Meg? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, all those in favor of adopting well, the- I, Actually, so there's a, we need to tidy up some of the dates on it, but um, first sentence is approved by May 9th, which should be changed to May 23rd. We really want to get picky draft 51223 at the top should be removed. And update date. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Kevin. All right. So um, approve the finance committee charge as amended. So does the original motion maker accept the amendment as a currently amended? Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, okay, now let's move on to facilities. And may I have, so help me with this, Patrick. Um, this was previously warned and it's been amended. So are we able to move to adopt it with these amended charges tonight? Yeah, I think we're since we're talking about this isn't policy, this is um, creation of a committee. So I think you can create the committee with the amendments that you make tonight and the membership that you appoint tonight in tonight's action. I don't think that I don't think that requires the same posting for adoption warning process that a policy adoption does. Okay, great. Okay, so can I have a motion to approve this facilities committee charge? Awesome. And a second. A second. Okay, all right, any discussion? So once again, the first sentence the dates from home. So if we adopt it tonight, it should be 523 instead of 623. Okay. Anything else? Thank Kathy. Kathy. Just looking in, in my copy, there's this, this bolded section that says full board discussion points. I don't think you really want that in there, correct? No, there's strike there's their strike through on it. Okay, and the copy that I just got doesn't have that, so. Mm-hmm. Where's the full board discussion? It's right below the committee purpose, the general charge. Yeah, right below that. Yeah. It's, it's right here. Yeah. Yep. yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well. It may just be whatever. Rest is assured, Kathy, I think it's, I think it's striked out here. Um, <clears throat> anything else? All right. So oh. if people yeah. aren't seeing the strikeouts, then that's not good because everybody should be looking at this the same way. Well, so there's a setting that somebody's that's not yeah. there. So the other on the web. And I get review comments on the right hand side by Kevin. So it should be. Yeah, same here. I think it's just a matter of. No, 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 edit access. There's going to be some um, view um, mode. Um, oh. I think because my, mine's a Chromebook, it's not letting me. Oh. Open oh. it in the same way. No, So on the top right on the. Toolbar, you should be um, clicked off on suggesting, I believe. No. But I'm thinking, so I'm seeing, I'm looking yeah. at who the document shared with. Mm -hmm. And I see Brad, Aaron, Krista, Kristen, Sarah, Steve, all have editor privileges. Yeah. Then I see yeah. others. Hold on, I have an idea. Yeah. 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 
it's a permission statement. Yeah. Okay, maybe refresh and yeah. see now if you can. Yeah. Ah, there we go. So, okay. so people should give, give, take a minute and look at that with those edits. So I can see all the comments, but there's no strike throughs. Hmm. Don't let me hold this up though. Keep keep going. And everybody else here sees strike. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a request. Okay. I'd be able to Okay, is everybody here good with the changes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So all those in favor of approving the facilities charge as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Now our next motion is to appoint members. Um so facilities members are Justin and Brad. Kathy, I think, right? And Kathy, are you a finance? Facilities. I'm sorry, facilities. facilities. Kevin, myself. Facilities Kathy. is Justin, Kathy, Kathy Kevin. and Kevin. Okay. All those, uh, I need a motion to appoint Justin. Kathy and Kevin to the facilities committee. And second. a second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now I need a motion to appoint um, Brad, Mike, yeah, and, Sarah. and Sarah to the finance committee. So I'll second. And who is that? Kristen. Okay. Okay. All those in favor of appointing Brad, Mike, and Sarah to the facilities committee, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any Did I call the facilities committee again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, all things considered. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. Oh, and I want to let folks know that I'm going to share with you a folder. So Jennifer, I may have shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because Jennifer took the committee folder and populated it with, um, and will populate with these updated charges, as well as an agenda template and a folder for your very first committee meeting, which will be June 13th. And so what committee chairs need to do is use that template to create an agenda for that meeting and for all future meetings. And those are warned one week before the meeting. So we haven't yet decided what future meeting dates we're gonna have, it won't happen until after the retreat, but that can, that folder is there. Do you have any numbers? Yeah, 520,000. Oh, 520,000. So the idea be a grant. Okay, thank you. B is for big. <laughs> <laughs> big bread basket. <laughs> All right, so it's 754. Mm -hmm. And we have three items and then an executive session. So we have the elementary school choice question, just a topic, um, board retreat, and community engagement committee update. Um, community engagement committee update. You can you can just read the update. Um, board retreat. Thank you to everyone for letting me know your availability. I'll look through all the responses. It looks like we're leaning toward August sixteenth. Um, and the only other thing is about potential topics. Um, but moving back up to elementary school choice, um, <clears throat> I did want to just share that we added to the board. In the board share notes, you'll see an added policy from Addison Northwest that we sh I shared in, um, in addition to the others that had been shared when this item was on the agenda previously. And 
I wanted to let Patrick share some feedback he got from the administration about the school choice issue. And then maybe after we do that, we can decide how we want to proceed. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Yep. Okay. So, yes, we added um, the intradistrict elementary school transfer policy, which is different than the school choice policy. So, Patrick, do you want to share what your conversation was with the administration, it, building administrators? Sure. So, we talked um, a number of weeks ago at this point um, and really talked about the two concepts the elementary choice concept, which was sort of a uh, I'll call it a wide open choice, knowing that there were some parameters that would be in place around if you know class sizes would exceed a certain number, things of that nature. But the the for any old reason choice policy, um, thinking about um, Addison Northwest as examples, has that sort of choice policy. And in addition to that, Addison Northwest has this transfer policy. And the difference really is choice policies for essentially any reason of the parents choosing, as long as they get it in. In the right timeline and fill out the right paperwork and it doesn't exceed class sizes and all those restrictions essentially the students make the move as requested the transfer policy is essentially when there are extenuating circumstances and it could be any time in the year that a student would transfer from one school in the district to another school in the district mm -hmm. <clears throat> as we talked about those sort of two concepts there was a lot of concern raised around the choice policy um, in terms of over time, what that, the, the potential for more significant migration for potentially unknown reasons uh, was concerning. There's a lot more comfort in more of the transfer concept where there are clear extenuating circumstances where it makes sense for a student to move from one school to another. Um, some of which we've talked, we've talked out actually about the, um, these concepts through our tuition waiver process um, and some of the challenges and, and benefits of those two applications. So the, the consent, the pretty strong consent of the admin team was a transfer policy that makes good sense and there was concern about a choice policy. So I guess my question is, would we like to dive into this a little bit more tonight? It's been tabled a few times now. So that would bring us to 8.30 and then we have an update from Patrick in executive session, which is part of our check-in. So wouldn't need to be that long. So what do folks think? I think we should dive into this a little bit. I think if we keep putting it off, then we run into next school year. When's the cutoff for getting everything in during the summer? Or if it's now? a choice, so at least looking at what, thinking about what Addison Northwest has done, the, the window for parents to request the choice is much earlier. Um, November, December, maybe I'd have to look at the policy again. So mm -hmm. we're either way ahead or way behind, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> I just think it would be good to have it in place with the procedures, everything kind of laid out pretty by the first day of school so that if somebody does want it, it's ready. Nobody's rushing. <clears throat> so does Edison Northwest run both of these policies in tandem? They do. I've talked with their superintendent and it hasn't been problematic for them to date to do so. Um, one of the, the differences being they have two elementary schools to choose from. Mm -hmm. Right. We have four. So it may, we may experience it differently than they do. And we may not. <clears throat> and so so no, just one quick thing. So are people okay if we set the timer and see how far we get? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Carry on. <laughs> I... I when I'm reading through some of these, it really sounds like um, my biggest worry is about equity. 
and if transportation is on the parents, then that does not allow for true school choice for everybody. Um, because if both parents are working, and can't get their kid to school at drop off time in another town, then they have to attend the school in their hometown. Um, so just thinking about that. Yeah. I I completely agree. That's very real. It is certainly the the great equalizer, transportation. And as I think about the potential of providing transportation with complete choice, it's somewhere between impossible and unaffordable. Mm -hmm. If a, if a parent has school choice, it should be up to them to bring their child to school. Right? Isn't that like if I wanted Jordan to go to Bristol, mm -hmm. the school bus is going to come to Mountain Road to pick her up? Well, right, and, we... yeah, as well, the thought is, is that there, I mean, some schools have a more coupled or decoupled busing system. So there's more availability for movement where, oh, this, this bus is already going through this town. Mm -hmm. That student could be picked up. Um, mm -hmm. But there, you know, like, if we want to say that everybody in our district has inter-district school choice, that's not mm -hmm. actually accurate if they're required to then bring their kid to school. Because if I have to be to work at seven or I work overnight, I can't, you know, then that doesn't, that means it's not an option for my child. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, I think we work hard to have the same options in all the buildings. So I don't know, like I, I could I literally go back and forth with that. <laughs> I think if we wait for the perfect everything, we'll never do anything. Um, and and it is a sticky wicket about transportation, but um, if we don't do it because of transportation, we'll never do it. Um, so I think there's privilege with it and um, but then again, maybe not. If somebody can figure out how to carpool, um, that has a lot to do with the attitude of the parents. Some parents may be very, be very cognizant of it and make it work, despite the challenges. And other parents probably care less, you know. And and that unfortunately may track along some of those demographic lines as well. Um, I. I think be, being a, I, I think it would be, I think it's there's there's a there's a little bit of um, hesitancy, obviously by staff, um, that may be running the risk of feeling uncomfortable about people exiting their building arbitrarily or not. Um, but I think also that could be a good driver to make sure everybody really sees and thinks about if they're offering the absolute best they can as well. Um, the old fashioned competition, if you will. I think there's some risks within the district with the, with the way at least some schools have a reputation and that may or may not drive people in and out. And unfortunately, we only, if you look at PICUS, when they developed this whole cost schedule and their white paper to the legislature a few years ago, PICUS identified probably the best, most economical, best services that could be provided would be with a school that has at least two classrooms per grade. You only have one school in the whole district that does that. And um, if that school um, lost students because there's a perception of how that school is being run or a reputation, if you will, and complicates that whole delivery system, it could 
really change on how the district is able to operate. But nonetheless, it makes it very clear that there's a situation at that particular school or another one um, in the future, five years from now, maybe totally different, um, that will play into um, people voting with their feet, if you will. And it's just it's just a reality, and um, I don't. I can see a certain amount of under, uncertainty. I can see a certain amount of reservation, but um, there, there's a reality there needs that needs to be addressed if it isn't being addressed. Um, that would drive students in or out of a building. Um, so that's imperfect. Um, but if we don't start somewhere, I, I, I'm, I'm a builder block sort of person. And if we don't start somewhere, we'll never get, we'll never go anywhere. So I, I, I think with all of this, all the reservations and all, all the imperfections, um, you know, there needs to be a stake put in the ground and then we need to work to make that improve. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I agree. I think it's, we keep talking about it. I think it's time. I think that the equity thing with transportation is always going to be a problem. However, I think that there's a lot of other pieces of equity that aren't addressed by us dealing with it. And I like, you know, people's choice of wanting to go in or out of a school could be based on literally if you're in that small of a school and you're sort of held held there in this tiny classroom with one other girl in your class, or you have um, you have way more opportunity if you could go to the larger school. So maybe I don't know that the influx or outflux of the big school versus little schools is it exactly as, I don't think it's actually going to be the, the outweigh. In some ways, it might be the, the influx um, about having mixed grades versus more opportunity when there's not mixed grades. Like that some people are looking for different things that I think we need to just acknowledge as a group and not limit it based on whatever it is that we've been making decisions about. I think it'd just be easier to know it was an option, like we're all in this together and we are trying to provide equal opportunities, but they're not the same. So um, it's not gonna be cookie cutter with each situation. With each situation. Yeah. And I think that the fear would be, oh, I'm gonna switch schools because I don't like this one teacher and then I'm going to switch back after this year is over. I just think there's ways we could probably uh, try to avoid that happening or that becoming like a precedent or a scenario that we fall into. Um, and also just trying to help people find the best. If something isn't working, trying to help them uh, find a really good scenario within our school system where it will work. And at the same time, I've been a big believer in bloom where you're planted. Like, let's see where we can do with where you are and like where you can grow. But if it's not working, that we actually have the tools within our district to help problem solve, to make something the best for every single kid. So I think it's kind of time to not stop us from doing it or not have barriers that people don't also it's the same thing like some people knew about it and they come talk to us and then other people or Patrick and other people don't even know like well what's the deal how do we go about doing it it's time to have a like this is how you go about doing it and that's more equitable than a lot of other things avoiding it Steve yeah, <clears throat> I think in some of the example uh, examples from the other districts, you know, they're they're dealing with uh, putting guardrails around this. You know, we have fears of mass migration from one school to the other. Well, they're dealing with it by saying, "Hey, look, it's we're going to control who's going to be allowed to do this or not based upon certain parameters." 
Are we going to balloon the class sizes on at this school? Are we going to empty out the classroom in this school? I mean, we're, we're not going to allow that to happen. Right. So we can we can put guidelines on it. And yes, so we might have a guinea pig here or two before we get just to see what kind of interest there really is in this and, and adjust based upon what we find out. It's kind of the um, trial and error method a little bit. And I think there's some good examples in the other district on ways that they've dealt with it and how you select people and you know, if you get a big crush, well then maybe you're limiting the number of actual seats and there's a lot of it. There's a lot of different ways to try to handle some of these, these little nuances. Um, but I think in general, I think it would be good to give people the tools to do it if it's available. And it may, maybe that there's not really that many people who want to take advantage of it anyway. It's probably more likely to be that than anything. So is the general feeling that folks think we should have some kind of school choice policy? Even if the policy is not to have a policy or, or not to allow it. <laughs> right. right. Because they get what, we're fi what we're finding is, <clears throat> well, it's wishy-washy right now. We've got, we've got uh, the policy through the grapevine right now. Right. We already right. have that, yeah. So my next question is, um, do we, in my chair notes, I said, you know, we, we can see if this could be wordsmithed and presented to the board through the Policy and Governance Committee, but I'm wondering if we think that step is necessary or if this group can decide on adopting a policy with language. So the Merger Study Committee policy that they were putting forward was essentially the Addison Northwest intra-district school choice policy. Um, so I think we have a couple of options. One is to just adopt that one as written. Another is to adopt that and an elementary school transfer policy. Um, the third is to have the policy and governance committee see what they think and then bring that a recommendation to us. Um, I'm just wondering what people think about how to move, how best to move this forward. I'm a little concerned that Policy and Governance Committee has a bunch of different things yeah. that are getting punted to them. And I'm not sure, I mean, we've all looked at the language so many times, so I guess I'm erring toward, we just decide. Um, based on Patrick's conversation with administrators, it sounds like their preference is a, transfer policy and not a school choice policy we just need to have just that mm -hmm. so maybe that's our question is you know do we just go with that instead of a school choice policy and i see that as a as a minimum right the the things we've been fielding thus far are more the transfer right. mm -hmm. issues than the choice issues and i think you'd want i i find it hard to believe we'd find ourselves in a position where we have a choice policy, which means you get your request in by November 15th, or you have no option, and then something significant happens and it makes perfect sense for a kid to beam in to go to Moncton. Right. And we're saying, nope, wait till November of next year and you can put in and we'll draw you out of the lottery like everybody else. I'd see that, that wouldn't really happen. And if we believe in that, then we should have something like that transfer policy that says, there, there is a way and here's the way how it happens and everyone is aware of it. Mm -hmm. So that could be our trial <laughs> policy. And that could be where we start. And along with the non-resident tuition policy, you know, we're gonna we're going to look at these things um, you know, in the, you know, within the next year to see how they've gone, to see if we need to beef them up or change them in any way. Kristen. I I really I really think that the inter school transfer policy is good. It also says in there that if they move within district, they can stay in their school. Which I don't I don't know if that's written anywhere, but I know that's kind of like you do that often. Yeah. 
um, for the remainder of the year kind of piece. So I think that both of those are really nicely written out. Um, I do really, I do really want to explore the school choice as well, but I also would love to hear, I don't know how this would work, but like just staff or admin team, like just more information about why, why people are hesitant to do the school choice um, piece of it. Um, and maybe this today is not the day, but I'm just, okay. I'm wondering about that too. So I don't want to make a decision that, that maybe we didn't think of something. And maybe coming back to Steve's point, that there may be an avenue where there's a choice policy that has those limiting factors clearly articulated that can address some of the concerns that the admin team had. Both, not so much the just in the receiving school getting too big, but you know, if if a if a class size is already under twelve or something, we could say that no students would be allowed to exit from that because. We don't want class sizes to get too small either. Liz, <clears throat> Liz. Northwest. hang on, Steve. Liz, yeah. thanks. Um, so uh, definitely, the transfer policy makes sense. Um, and I <laughs> agree with that. It's unequitable at this moment. Uh, a note about transportation, right? Um, in some cases, this may be nearer to their work, or it may be nearer to a grandma and grandpa, or it may be nearer to somebody um, whose house that they, right? Like there's a lot of factors. The person who they drop their kids off to in the morning when they're working the night shift, or, you know, like, I don't know, like there's so many things. Um, and we, we could support lists of people going out and being like, these are people that go to this school. If you're looking to carpool or transport somehow, we, we that can be a uh, figure, I don't know. Um, and I, I just think it's interesting that it's also geographically it being one of the state, one of the few reasons that the state would allow choice um, beyond what they currently approve is the geographical piece. Um, You know, I do think that I feel that no matter what school my child went to, he would have done well. I think there would have been unique challenges at different ones. Big challenges, right? Like there might be some things that would have been different, but I do think that the people within each school, the communities, the children, the staff, every part of it, would work to meet any student's needs that walk in the door. And I think they can in, in a lot of, if not all the ways. I think they are awesome. And our work is to make sure that they're doing that. And then this is kind of outside of that. Um, this, is, this is putting a little more in the hands of, we're, we're in a predicament in our district where, not a predict, where, so the, choice of our communities was that there was a town vote if a school were to ever close. That's a big deal. We've put a lot of power right there into each one of our communities. And I think parent choice is the other side of that coin. And, and I don't know what could possibly be more powerful than that. And if it came to a point where um, we were one, like where, I mean, I don't see any other way than going to a community and saying, hey, you know, we've got three kids in every grade level at this school. We would like to present this to you as a situation, right? So that's, that's like a, fully grassroots like from the bottom from those receiving the services making a statement I don't think that would ever happen I doubt this will be very many kids kind of like the high school one where we don't even fill up our 10 slots that we have to accept people but I I, I so I but if it were to I think it's a powerful message we'd want to hear um 
And the only place, because I know that we're kind of talking about maybe the transfer policy versus the school choice, but even the school choice, as I read it and understand it, is within our district. And I just, we just did it right. And I'm, you know, I definitely continue this conversation for another day for sure. I don't need to land anywhere. I feel really good about interdistrict, interdistrict um, accepting students from another district into our school. So I think I that there's a pretty big limitation just by saying that this is even within our own district. Like that in and of itself is pretty big. It's not well, I work in Burlington and Hinesburg Elementary School is two miles from my house, right? Like that's, there's so much, like this already is limited from my perspective, or I live right next to Virginia, or I'm right on the border of Middlebury, right? Like there are even, so I already find this to be limiting in just that it's within our school district. And I think that's also a starting place. And I think um, that that's that I guess that's where I'm at at this moment. And I think I want to focus on being sure that as a school board, all our kids are getting what they need everywhere. And um, I, I just find it to be, a, I, I guess I have a hard time seeing the downside of doing it. So that's, I am taking notes and listening really carefully and I appreciate everybody and I um, look forward to thinking more about the other side of the coin from my perspective so thanks for having the conversation I think I would add the the concern that came from the admin team was and I think you hit the nail on the head Liz was in that helping to ensure our ability to meet the needs of the students and without carefully crafted kind of guardrails or restrictions, we run the risk of not being able to meet the needs of students. If there's, whether it's a mass exodus from one place or a mass sort of entrance to another, either one of those scenarios could make that harder to do than what we currently have. So I think that's that's something that everyone has in common is ensuring that however this lands that we're positioning ourselves to make sure we can meet student needs. Yeah, <clears throat> and so in terms of those guardrails, I mean, what Addison Northwest writes really in one paragraph is that you're on the hook. You know, it's yep. you got to make up the rules. You you get to say yes or no. Um, if there's a lottery, you got to figure out how many slots are in the lottery. But you're not coming back to the board every time, according to Addison Northwest, anyway. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of burden on your back to make this run properly, or I don't know, properly you know, without tipping the scales too far in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's that's really how they handle it. Um, they they basically say that um, you know. The request may be denied if the requested move may have negative impacts on class size or staffing at the sending or receiving school or due to other extenuating circumstances. Determination or approval or denial will be made by the superintendent. Um, so then, you know, you along with the principals sort of get together and see how many applications you have and figure out how many of them you want to approve. And I think the reason for that is the I don't think we could even begin to imagine the number of possible considerations that would go into because some of its numbers, some of its needs, some of its, um, you know, family history or like there's so many factors that can go into um, what could work or might not work very well. That that language of extenuating circumstances is that sort of <laughs> that allows you to take all factors into consideration to try and make sure that it's going to be successful. Well, and I think at the same time, you're you're basically going to take the first round of applications and see how many actually are transfers. <clears throat> you know, which of these are not really just arbitrary, which of them 
would fall under a transfer. Right. And there's typically <clears throat> language that if it's the, the oldest child, all subsequent children get to go to that school too. So that factors into the numbers consideration. I know um, in the district I'm currently in, they say that there's you know value valuing family and that siblings get a priority, but they're not guaranteed. Not guaranteed yeah. So if there's if the kindergarten is full, the kindergarten is full. Mm -hmm. um, and you can be on a wait list, but kindergarten is full. Yeah. Um, and they try not to move kids in the, the year for obvious reasons. Um, but they it's kind of a nice I know that they talk about like homes home-based school, valuing family, and transportation zones because their their busing is different, but it's there's quite a process. Um, I don't know that a lot of families choose, even though they can go to any of them, um, because they do think of like their community and they, oh, play dates are all the way across two towns now or something. And, um, that was oh sort of a special cohort. program or something. Yeah. yeah. My cohort of those kids would be with right. outside of school. Right. Mm -hmm. Are not going with them. Yeah. Right. Over here and over here. Patrick, mm -hmm. did um, building administrators get to see the school choice policy with the various guardrails and things like that? And yeah, I did think that I not still alleviate concerns? <laughs> Even seeing that, there were concerns. I'm pretty sure you guys were. I shared the draft of the Denison Northwest links right now. Um, so they saw that, and even having seen that, there were still some of those concerns. Um, which again, we can we can have more language with more restrictions than what AS Northwest has. Um, and we can even work with administrators to talk through what some of that language might be that mm -hmm. I was wondering about that also. So then maybe it makes sense to do the interschool transfer first. For a year or two, and just see—is that what would be his suggestion? I, well, it doesn't give you a very good um, feel for the folks who, because the transfer policy is for like extenuating circumstances. Right. It's not going to give you the a feel for the folks that just, hey, I want my thirty mm -hmm. percent. I don't have an extenuating circumstance. I just want to be able to listen. Yeah. I, I. Uh, I think to go hand in hand, we we de facto are practicing school choice um, through the great fund. I think they should go hand in hand. And granted, um, you know, maybe there's some parameters, guardrails, what do you want to call them, to consider. All that stuff can be changed as um, uh, set in stone might be for a period of time or for a year, but it can be adjusted. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we need to start making steps here. And steps means that nothing's necessarily static forever. Um, and quite honestly, the concerns of staff should be highlighting um, areas of concern, obviously, but there are also areas that there needs to be action to, um, I don't want to say prevent, but understand and react to whatever the perceived or real desire is. I mean, if, if we just start running around with fears, then that's not going to solve the fears. So I think we need to be um, open it up. Maybe it's framed in such a way, but we need to understand why we don't think it's working and work those issues as well. I'm just going to throw out a two-minute warning, too. Yeah. Kathy? Is there a way that we could survey the families in our schools to find out if this was an option, what would you choose? Where would you go? And, you know, that would give us a little bit more of an understanding of what their real interest is out there rather than just kind of throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks. It would just it would be really helpful. Uh, that was where I was going. And if we did that, could it be maybe a community engagement mm -hmm. thing and not? Yeah. If it might hold more weight coming from yeah, community I mean, engagement than the board itself. Not only yeah. are you interested in school trips, but why? Yeah. You know. <clears throat>
It could be anonymous, you know. But you could get at least a, a sense for what kind of a lift we're really talking about. I think that could also open our eyes to the perception of current parents. Like, oh, you 10 people want to leave this school and they seven of them say state the same reason. Oh, yeah. maybe we should either address that or educate them that that isn't as big of an issue. I don't whatever. Just it might kind of show us where people are. So I wonder if we could um that is possible. And I wonder also if we could get input on the language from administrators also that they if they had feedback on how, you know, if if we as a board feel like we do want to have some sort of school choice policy in addition to a transfer policy, mm -hmm. given the concerns you shared, what would you do with this language? And you could bring that back to us and we could look at that and the sample policy and decide um, what makes the most sense instead of trying to imagine how to, recognizing that no policy is gonna cover every example and potentiality, but their input would be helpful. Um, so given those two things, it sounds like maybe we like the idea of moving this forward and we don't yet have the language in place yet. So. Um, Not to keep the can too much more. No. Given, but I think we're interested now. Mm -hmm. Versus not interested. Right. It's different. Kathy, I'm good. Is your hand up again, Kathy, or is that from before? From before. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have some good. Perfect momentum and then maybe Patrick and Aaron and I can think about where to put this in a time frame that can get us the feedback we want. Okay. It would be great uh, if, you could, if you could do that survey before school gets out. That way we'd be able to start the school year in the fall knowing who wanted to shift where. Yep. Um, there's one other housekeeping thing I wanted to mention before I forget, um, just making sure that folks check and respond to your board emails promptly, especially when you see a note on um, the pay request, Adobe document, because that gets stuck if you don't respond and then it can't get approved by the other board members. So that's just uh, passing that on. Um, okay, so board retreat, um, I'll let folks know what date we decide leaning on the August 16th. And for topics, um, you know, I think Patrick and Aaron and I have talked about a few ideas. Um, it's not until August, so we have time, but if there's um, anything in particular people think would be helpful, maybe you can send that to me in an email. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. And then you see the community engagement committee update. So we're at 8.33. Um, and the only thing left is to have a check-in with Patrick. So can we maybe um, say that we're not going to take action when we come out and ask our visitors to depart and then um, just close out the meeting? When we come out from the executive session with no action being taken. Any public comment before we go in? In self evaluation. Okay. Is there public? <clears throat> All right. So we don't have any public visitors. Um, so, yeah. So, can we do the meeting evaluation now and then we'll go into the executive session? Okay. Go ahead, Erin. Um, level of engagement of all the members, high or low? Okay. okay. Uh, agenda followed. I said yes with the amendments discussed beforehand. So movement of items from the consent to the governance. Added time for school choice discussion and move the executive session time. So the chair effectively established the agenda and materials for distribution to the board. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Just, yeah. uh, just barely. <laughs> <laughs> Is the chair effective in fostering a professional culture regarding fair and open deliberation, participation, and ensuring integrity of board process? Yes. Um, and I added uh, other feedback for chair. 
What went well with the meeting? I put robust discussions, adopting policies, adopting committees, and committee language. Mm -hmm. uh, more timely than usual. <laughs> We're not done yet, sir. <laughs> Snap. Driving now. We are drivers. Suggestions for ways to improve future meetings. Let's do this again. Poor Justin, you're baking. No, I'm all right. <laughs> you're also under the hot lights. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. That's right. Okay. All right. So um, we need a motion to go into executive session, Title One, BSA Five, Section Three One Three A. We did. That. We did. Yeah. Um, statute to get finished. But Sorry? So that statute didn't get finished. There's more to that. There's more to that. <laughs> Did I look it up? Personnel, right? The appointment evaluation or employment of a public officer of personnel, 313A3. So moved. Aaron, and a second? second. Steve, all those in favor, please say aye. Can you pose? Let me see. Okay, so we're just going to stay right here and um, let our folks sit up. Other folks sit up. Take a, take five or two. Take a two minute bio break if you need it. <laughs> 